That was quite the intro. I'm going to lay down the word today. I like it, Bryson. I might. Actually, I was telling people I'm channeling my, my inner Southern Baptist preacher today, so I might get a little excited. But yeah, so my name is Rachel, and I'm really, really excited to be here with you all today, whether you're here with us in the auditorium or you're jumping online with us. Um, I know that it is amazing that we can join together. It is so awesome to be back together. So my husband, Jason, and I, we moved to Salt Lake City about 13 years ago. Much like a lot of you were transplants here, we did not grow up here. Just prior to that, we had spent about four years in Orange County, California. And then prior to that, we lived in Logan, Utah, up where we had actually met and dated and got married. And both of those places that we lived, Logan and Orange County, Jason and I had developed some pretty cool communities, a pretty cool circle of friends. I will be very, very honest. Those circles of friends were based around our love for partying. Am I allowed to say that on stage? So it really was. That's why we did that. It, music and partying, having a good time, living in the moment, right? So then we moved to Salt Lake City. We had um, our, our daughter, and I wanted to be near my mom, and she lived here. So we moved here, and things were a little bit different. We couldn't develop a kind of community. It just didn't click the way it had before, and most of it was probably because we weren't doing that party scene anymore as much. We had a baby. We, our son was living with us, and everything changed, so it was really difficult for us to get into a community. We made some good friends through work and different things. And then it got a little bit weirder, more weird, weirder. Our daughter got very sick. And so our life even took a bigger turn where it was all based on hospitalizations and doctor's visits and medical equipment. And that little community that we had developed got even smaller. And so we felt pretty alone a lot of the time. And it was something we just kind of were pushing through. And um, it was a really difficult for any of you who've ever been in that place where you just don't have a big circle of friends or you don't have people. I'm sure you can relate if you've ever been there. So then fast forward a couple of years and I find myself in the South Campus uh, building when we used to rent out the Salt Lake Community College. I wasn't a believer, but I was desperate. I was desperate for something more than how I was living, desperate for something bigger than me. And I sat there listening to these pastors talk about this God I didn't understand, talking about forgiveness, talking about grace. I didn't understand it. I was so confused. So I just kept going back because it was so interesting what was going on. Jason starts attending with me. We get invited into a Life Together group by the amazing Mark and Sarah Demiglio, and we show up in their house, and it's this beautiful home with all of these people. And all they wanted to do, you guys, was be together, like all the time. They were so happy. They, they were eating together all the time. They were just loving on each other, having these awesome conversations. And, and Jason and I just kept going back because it just felt so amazing being there around them. A couple months later, it was a Christmas Eve service, and um, the theme was all in, because why wouldn't you pair the birth of Jesus with poker? <laughs> it made sense to me at the time. So we go, and at the time, you had to have a ticket that, you know, reserved because there was four different service times, and you had to pick up which time you were going to go, because we were in this little small building. And of course, because it's all in, your ticket was a poker chip. Right? Jesus, poker. I get it. So in the message, the this, this idea, though, was if you were ready to go all in, to lay it down, accept Jesus as your Savior, you were going to take that poker chip, and you were going to walk, and you were going to put it on the table up at the front. And Jason and I gave our lives to Jesus that day, and we laid down our chip, and we went all in. The really cool thing when we moved to this building, one of our amazing staff members found the old poker chips and gave us a set of all of them as a reminder of that day that we went all in. So cool. But here I want to walk with you guys because here's the thing about that. We then had the Holy Spirit in us in a way that we, we wanted to do what those people in that house were doing. We wanted to be around people all the time. We were around these people and they were giving up breakfast and lunches and dinners and multiple nights a week, Saturdays for service projects, Sundays. I spent my entire life, you guys, complaining about having to attend church for three hours a day. My entire life complained about it. And here were our new friends giving up where they were giving up hours on Sundays. They were serving in the first service so that people could come and be in service. They were in Adventure Canyon or Connections. And then they were attending in the next. So they were easily spending four to five hours a day there. 
and, we, and loving it. They just couldn't get enough, and it was amazing. And so that fire went in us from this tiny little spark that was interested in this Jesus thing to a homecoming parade bonfire. It blew up in us, you guys. I mean, you all know those bonfires. They're giant. And that fire was in us, and we couldn't get enough. We had to be around those people. We had to be involved with it. It was the first time that we could really see that the Holy Spirit draws people together. You can't help but want to be part of that. You can't help it. Now, I wanna ask you, have you think about it? Maybe you're like me. Maybe you came to Jesus and everything blew up for you. Or maybe you're not like me, right? Maybe you are a believer and you're like, I don't have that. I'm not in a bunch of groups. I'm not in any group. I tried it and it didn't work out. Maybe you're not a believer at all and you're just checking this Jesus thing out and you're asking yourself, can I really have that? Like a community that's so deep that they'll show up and they'll be there for you at two in the morning when your one kid gets sick and you have to go to the hospital for this and this kid's at home. Can I really have that kind of community? Or maybe <laughs> you're like, nice story, Rachel. I don't need that. I'm good with what I have. I'm good with that circle of friends that I've made at work or that I party with. I'm an introvert, Rachel. I actually don't even like people. Maybe you're one of those ones that I see up in the shadows up there and you've been here for seven years and you've never introduced yourself. Don't worry, we'll find you. <laughs> we will, we always do eventually. And then you'll end up right here in the front row. So working in the Life Together ministry for the past, I don't know how many years anymore, I've heard it all and I've seen it all. I've seen that need for community that burns in people. I see their desire for, to be known and loved and seen. I've seen it through people who don't want to be in community. I hear it in them that they desperately actually want someone to come along and walk with them through life, through their faith. I've seen it. I've seen, honestly, that desire, that spirit, that fire rising up in people the way it did me. And I wanna help blow that up, ignite that fire, because I do believe that the Holy Spirit draws people together. So I wanna walk through what does God say about this? We gotta go to scripture, am I right? So here, I wanna walk through um, a passage what, that shows us what the early church began to do as they received the Holy Spirit in them. Two weeks ago, Mike Rutledge took us through Pentecost and, and what that looked like for the apostles to have the fire and the wind come inside them. And then Dave took us through the boldness of when you have that, of reaching out to others and sharing your faith that the spirit will give you that boldness that you maybe don't have. Maybe you're probably not like me where you're loud and obnoxious 99% of the time. And so maybe you, I, I, I need the Holy Spirit to tone it down. Maybe you need the Holy Spirit to tone it down or light up so you can be out there being bold. The awesome thing though is we have that. We have that inside of us. And we know when we have the Holy Spirit with us, we have that fire and we know that the Holy Spirit draws people together. So whether you're, uh, yeah, whether you're here with us or online at home right now, or even watching later in the week, you have to know that this community, this kind of life is available to all of us. So I'm gonna take us through Acts 2, verses 42 through 47. And in my Bible, it has the little tagline that says, the fellowship of believers. So they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. 
and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So in this passage, which is probably the most popular passage that talks about the Christian church and what it should look like, am I right? If you've been part of church for a week, you've probably heard this passage. But in it, I wanna break it down. It gives us four key characteristics that, that are the lives of the early church, the lives of the early Christians, but also how we can model our lives. So those four things that it breaks down, instruction, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. And I'm gonna spend some time today with you and we're gonna dig into each of these, what they mean, and why, when we have the Holy Spirit living in us, we would be compelled and moved to live this way. So we're gonna hit the first one, instruction. So they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So here we see that the early church, they literally just became believers in Jesus and, and the story that they had heard and, and they were excited about this. So not only did they recognize that they needed to hear and learn about the gospel, they needed to be devoted to this. So the Greek word that in this, for that devoted, I'm honestly, you guys, I'm not even gonna attempt to pronounce it. I'm not, but what it means when you, when you look at it, it means to give constant attention, persevere, constantly diligent. I don't know very many things in my life that I am constantly diligent about, but here the early church was telling us they were constantly diligent to hearing and doing the apostles' teachings. So being devoted didn't mean just hearing it, didn't mean just attending the service where the, you know, the apostles gave a message, but it meant doing it, right? So knowing the Bible, knowing the gospel is crucial to our lives as believers. So while studying for this message, I actually read in one commentary this amazing quote that I wanna share. And it says, healthy congregations consume a healthy diet of sound doctrine. They feast on the word, which tells the message of the gospel and the savior. They feast. Do we feast on the word here? Are you feasting? Are you devoted where you're, you're not just hearing it, you're, but you're doing it? You're submitting to the authority of scripture? So verse 43 says, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. So I love this because they're out doing these amazing things like Jesus was doing, wonders and signs. And it wasn't just for show. It actually validated and complemented what they were teaching. It was a way that compelled people to say, whoa, what was that? I wanna know more about that. And so then they, more people were more interested and it kept compelling people to come in. Just like when Jesus was here performing miracles, it made people realize there's something different about this and I want to know what it is. They recognized right away as they were seeing these and they were hearing the teachings, they were together as they were doing this, and they recognized right away that the Holy Spirit draws people together. So that leads us right into the next one, which is fellowship. So fellowship, I have to laugh, I feel like is a pretty churchy word. Let's go fellowship. Um, you know, but I love it that the, the meaning of it is so much deeper. It, it doesn't just mean friends or community. It definitely does not mean coffee and cookies after church out in the lobby. But what it means is a devoted again. They were devoted to fellowship with one another. So here in verse 46, it shows you how devoted every day they continue to meet together in the temple courts and they broke bread in their homes. So what I absolutely love here about that passage, that verse, is that it shows that the, the need and the desire for them to be together, both corporately in the large settings, the temple courts, which is pretty much like what we're doing here this Sunday in this building. We're meeting together corporately. But then they also saw how desperately they needed to be devoted to community together, breaking of bread in their homes. So that would be like our Life Together groups or a discipleship group, or those of you who are right now at home, maybe watching with your friends or family. Recognizing the need for both of those is how they recognized the Holy Spirit was moving in them. It, they were compelled to do this together. 
One, so they could receive those teachings. Two, so they could sit together and process those teachings and, and learn more and be challenged in their faith. So verse 44 says, all the believers were together and had everything in common. And they sold property and possessions to give anyone who had a need. So here we see that fellowship, again, isn't just about getting together and having a great time. This is the difference between the life Jason and I had and the friendship circles we had before. It was about a good time. And we had some great times and we had some really good you know, friends with that. But this was bigger than that. That What they recognized is that they were participating and taking care of each other. That's what we saw at the Demiglio's house. That's what we saw in the other small groups that we got into. That's what we see being part of this congregation. We have been through crazy stuff in our house. Like, I don't even know, Ugh, sometimes. <laughs> and I can't even tell you what it feels like to be like, how are we gonna get through this one? And then get a text telling us someone's gonna jump in and help us get through it. Or just checking in on us to make sure that we're doing okay with everything going on. But we also have the opportunity then to give to others as we're rec- we're, while we're in life with people I love when I hear about a small group that tells me that they had a person or a family in their group go through hard times and how they rallied around them to take care of them. I mean, I've heard of stories of two o'clock in the morning phone calls and the whole group heading over to the house to be there. I love it when we as a congregation can do that. Mark, I'm gonna put you on the spot again, man. A couple years ago when Mark had his stroke, you couldn't find a spot in that hospital to stand. There were so many people there for that man because this church showed up for him because he's amazing and we love you. But that was amazing to see people giving to each other. But here's, I love it. In Hebrews 10, 24, we see even deeper. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deed, deeds. Let us consider that, how when we have the Holy Spirit in us, when the Holy Spirit draws people together, we can do these kind of things. We can give to others. We can be there for them in a way probably they've never had anyone there before. Number three then, breaking of bread. Oh my gosh, this is like my favorite one. If you know me at all, you know that I'm part of the sixth love language, which is food. Um, many of you during pandemic, you know, the thing you were hoping and you couldn't wait for after everything was back open again was hugging and touching. And we're looking at you, Susie Nelson. And you just couldn't wait to be hugging. That wasn't me. It wasn't me. Um, I'm not anti-touch. It's just not my favorite. My favorite is food. So the thing I couldn't wait to do from that lockdown was gather my friends and family for dinner again. It's my favorite thing. It's the thing I miss the most with barbecues in the backyard, eating out with friends, you name it. I miss that the most. So when our house finally felt we could step out a little bit, the first thing we did was we invited my parents over for dinner. We hadn't seen them. They lived 10 minutes away. We hadn't seen them in almost six months. And then we invited our Life Together group over for a barbecue. And I was in heaven. Apparently my love for food is biblical. We can see here, I was just, I'm just modeling my life after the early church, basically. So Paul teaches us in this, though, that not only were they, break, or actually Paul t- teaches us in a minute, so Luke's telling us here that they, not only were they breaking bread in their homes like as an ordinary meal, but they were also breaking bread in their home as the Lord's Supper or communion as we call it. And we're actually going to get to take communion here in a couple of minutes. And I'm so excited to be doing that with each of you. But here it's really cool because we understand that when you take communion, you don't do it on your own. You do it in community. And we get to do that here together because we understand that what the the Lord did on the cross wasn't just to reconcile us to him. He died for us to reconcile our sins, but he also did it so that we are reconciled with each other. Because he forgave me, I can forgive you and you can forgive her. And it goes and it goes because of that. So we take communion together. And if so, we have to recognize if we're gathering for a meal or we're gathering here together to take the Lord's Supper, the Holy Spirit draws people together. We have that Holy Spirit in us. For lastly, it's gonna be prayers. And I absolutely love the image of the early church 
participating in prayers together. And here's the best part is verse 47. They said, together they were praising God. What a beautiful image that the first church, the first believers, the way that they prayed was praising God. This is one of my favorite prayers. This is uh, often when I lead our staff uh, prayer time. I, I just, I don't wanna, uh, that's all I wanna do is praise God for who he is. So that's why I absolutely love that. When was the last time we praised God and just through our prayers, just praised? I mean, I can't, I can't stand it. They gathered together to praise God together. So they would have prayed corporately still um, in the temple courts. They would have prayed privately like the Jewish culture had where they would you know, three times a day be dedicated to that. So they again devoted their lives to prayers. And in this time it would have shifted away from the, the Jewish culture of prayer into praising God together. And as they joined together, they saw that the Holy Spirit draws people together. So as I was preparing for this message, I had to stop and I had to think. Yeah, we had this fire, this kind of life when we first became believers, but I had to ask, do I still have this kind of life? I have to ask you, do you have that kind of life? It's a pretty intense kind of life, right? I mean, I was joking, like, really, it's just a different time of, you know, uh, because we couldn't gather together daily. They didn't actually mean we needed to follow this. But if we can model our lives after this and recognize we don't have to will our way into that, that the Holy Spirit in us is going to drive us forward into that, the Holy Spirit draws people together, we don't have to do it. But trust me, I get it. I know life is busy and there's a ton of moving parts, right? I don't know about you guys, 2020 was like on slow motion. Like we couldn't wait for it to get over. And now 2021 is like, I think trying to catch up. It's like trying to make up lost time. And I mean, I'll, I'll text someone and I'll be like, oh, I haven't heard from them in a couple of days and I'll go to text them back. And it's been like three weeks. I'm sure I'm all alone, right, in that. <laughs> but here's the thing, we can be, the convenience church, where we show up on Sunday and we go and we're like, nice message, thanks, Rach. And we go about our day. We log in. I'm gonna call some of you out. So I already know someone out there right now is doing chores while they're listening to this message. I already know. It's convenient for you to be listening to the message and getting the chores done at home. I see you. I know what you're doing. Or maybe you're one of those who logs on later in the week or when you maybe get to it or you're like, oh, I'll get back to that, right? We have become a convenience church. We are constantly devoted to gathering, constantly devoted to being filled with the spirit and living this out. So here in a minute, we're gonna take communion and I want you to do a couple of things as you do this. We take communion for a couple of different reasons. We do it obviously in remembrance of Jesus and his sacrificial love for us. But it's also an amazing time for us to sit and reflect on our lives, on our hearts. It's a time to confess if something's going on in your life that shouldn't be there. Confess that you can't do this on your own that you need Jesus, that you need the Holy Spirit to burn in you. It's a time to repent. Cast that off, turn, and head down the right path. It's a time for God to speak to you, tell you what you're supposed to be doing next. I know for me, that simple phrase and Dave's been walking us through this and in our conversations, it's been so beautiful to say, I don't have the power to do this on my own. Because I don't know about you guys, I'm pretty tired these days. Last year was just nuts. And I think a lot of us have some fatigue from living in constant crisis mode, right? So we keep trying to will ourselves. Oh, I'm gonna will my way into Tuesday night small group. I'm gonna will my way to coffee with that person. 
and then I'm gonna get really tired. I'm gonna will my way into Sunday, and then I'm gonna turn where it just becomes something that just and not quite, I don't quite have this time for that anymore. Well, the amazing thing is, you guys, you don't have to will your way into this. The Spirit is driving you. The Spirit wants to go from that spark to that homecoming bonfire. It wants to blow up in you. So as we take communion, I want you to ask yourself those four questions. Am I living my life the way I should? Am I living my life this way like the early church? And if not, why not? Maybe you have to confess, I'm, I'm just too busy, too busy for that, don't have time. I actually don't want that. Thanks, Rach. Confess that. I don't think I need that. I tried to have that and it didn't work. And then repent. Repent of maybe where you've gone astray. Maybe there's a sin in your life. I know I've had to do this even recently. Repent of a sin that was in my life that was blocking me from what the Holy Spirit wanted to do. Turn away from that and receive what Jesus has for you. And then I want you to ask, Jesus, what are my next steps? What am I supposed to do? Jesus, the Holy Spirit wants to burn in us, everyone. I feel it so much. Yes, I'm the spokesperson for community. Yes, I'm that person who's annoying and wants to be all up in everybody's faces. I'm the extrovert that's always hanging out. But you don't have to be me to want this and to have it. You get to be you. The Holy Spirit wants to move in you to build our church, to build the kingdom of God here on earth. My prayer today and for this whole time as I've prepared has been, Holy Spirit, give us the power and the strength that only you can give. So as we're getting ready to take communion, I want you just to think about for a sec your life. Just like I did as I was getting ready for this. What would your life look like if you push that other stuff aside and you receive what the Holy Spirit wanted to do in you? What if you allowed the Holy Spirit to draw people together? What would your life look like? How would it be different? Honestly, friends, whether <laughs> wherever you're at, if you are a believer, no matter where you're at in your faith, I need you to recognize you have this power. I don't even have to pray that. I just have to pray that you receive that power because you have it. And if you're not a believer, you have the ability to have that power, to have that fire, to have wind and fire come over you, to have Jesus fill you up. Philippians 2.13 says, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purposes. His good purposes. He will fill us. His spirit will fill us and will compel us to do the things that we need to do to be living this kind of life. It's not just about being friends with people and being in that circle. This is about the way that God wants us to live. And more than anything, we know that the Holy Spirit is drawing us together. Are we going to allow him to do that? What would K2 look like if we started living like this? We wouldn't have an empty seat in this house, would we? What would Salt Lake look like if we were out there all the time being crazy for Jesus, filled with that, and there was bonfires all over the valley? You know what I think it would look like? And the Lord added, and 
And the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. I think that's what it would look like. And I think we would truly see the Holy Spirit draws people together. We're gonna take communion now together as an amazing body of Christ here. It's very humbling for me to walk you through this. I actually don't even know if I've ever walked people through communion before. So my heart's a little bit on fire and quivering right now. If you need some, uh, one of the communion things, Nancy's right here, so just raise your hand and we'll get that for you. Lord Jesus, as we prepare to, to take this communion in your name, I pray right now that you would ignite the fire in us, that your spirit will be ignited in us and we will receive that spirit. Jesus, we pray that you will fan into flame the fire in us, that you will push us where we are supposed to be, how we are supposed to be living. We take this bread today, Jesus. And you said to take this in remembrance of me. So Jesus, today we look to your cross for all you've done for us. We remember how you laid down your life for us, your body given for us. And as we take the juice, Jesus, you said, Take this in remembrance of my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus, you gave your life for us and our sins. We receive that forgiveness today. Jesus, we press into that forgiveness. And Jesus, we press into the life that you are calling us to. Friends, I know that the Holy Spirit wants to burn in you, wants to be a homecoming bonfire. And I pray today that you'll think of those four things and that the Lord will move in you and that that Spirit will draw you together.